internet, and welcome back to Makers on Tap, the podcast where makerspace directors drink and talk about making stuff and maker culture. Today we've got several interviews from our time at Milwaukee Maker Fair. Um, specifically, these interviews are f- um, from the hangout at the Milwaukee Makerspace. Uh, next week we'll have the episode where we talk to the exhibitors at Milwaukee Maker Fair. But for now, uh, please enjoy all these interviews. All right, so this is Joe from Makers on Tap at the Milwaukee Makerspace after Milwaukee Maker Fair with, who are you? I am Caleb Kraft from uh, Make Community, previously Maker Media. So we do Make Magazine and Maker Fair. All right, so I'm really excited to have you on because I've been nerd following you for a bunch of years with your mechanical irises and just like... Oh, thank you. You you do all of the digital fabrication stuff that I really enjoy, oh. except for instead of making machines, you actually make things with your machines. So that's it, it's been fun to follow you. Oh, thank you. Um, so it's fun to meet you. Okay. Um, what was? Is this your first time at Milwaukee Maker Fair? This is. This is. Yeah. Is this your fir- so? Is this your first time at Milwaukee Maker Space? Yes. Which is actually where we're at right now. Yeah. What's your thoughts on this space? Man, this place is incredible. I I wish we had a space like this back home. I'm from Springfield, Missouri, uh, and we don't have a makerspace there. A few people have tried to various levels of success, but we just don't have one right now. Um, So, you know, I don't have the opportunity to, like, go back in the back corner to the full ceramic setup and just, like, give it a try, you know, like they they have here. It's just an incredible space. Yeah, like... Uh, I was telling Aaron earlier, their jewelry area is almost as big as our entire maker space. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, it's impressive. It's impressive. Yeah, it's it's incredible. We're standing in the laser room, which is like almost half as big as our clean space. Like, their their they meeting know, area it's is... It's definitely a quarter, at least. It, it's Yeah, so I don't know. Here, Aaron. Am I talking about the... the what am I talking about? I don't know. Asking questions. Okay. <laughs> we're, we're bad at this. Yeah. You tell them if we planned for this. Yeah. It so, sounds like you guys needed a few more drinks to get this we don't ever operating, right? Oh, okay. Anybody, okay. So it throws off the vibe. All right. All right. <laughs> so what are you most excited about for Make Community so far? Uh, you know, th- that's always a tough question. It's weird. Me and uh, Matt Stoltz, who's here, we always joke about like when people ask, what's your favorite thing or what are you most excited about? It like immediately clears your mind. like It wipes everything out. Oh, yeah. It's like a trick, right? Yes. So we ask each other just to mess with each other. Um, you know, it depends on what you're talking about. Are you talking about like, what am I excited about that we're doing as a company or what am I excited about that I see at maker fairs or what am I excited about? But you know, I mean, there's so many different areas uh, that I could look at, but what I'll jump into is maker fairs. What I'm seeing when I go to maker fairs, what excites me. Um, it's changed over the years. I've been doing this for over 10 years now. And uh, right now I just get really excited to see something new and interactive like that people are interacting with and touching and messing with that I haven't seen before. So there's stuff that's still incredible that that people are going to experience like for the first time like a 3D printer people say don't, you know, whatever, but if it's your first time seeing a 3D printer they're amazing. Mm-hmm. So like at this maker fair what really caught my eye was uh Briggs and Stratton had a riding lawnmower thing, one of those ones you stand on that they had hacked So you stand on it and you use the levers to control a little radio controlled version. Oh, yeah. And then they have cameras above it using some kind of computer vision system to determine where it's been on the on the area. And and you're like playing a game where you're trying to mow this area and weeds keep popping up. I've never seen that before. And so it was really cool. I don't know if it's exciting to other people, but (laughs) since it's something I've never seen before, I'm like, whoa, you know, I want to get down and. Play with the wires. Yes, yeah. I, I was, I was interested in that too. So we've talked about it a bit before, but how do you, since you've been doing this for so long with maker fairs, what have you seen in the past, you know, five-ish years with these fairs as far as um, a shift in a show and tell mentality to more of an interactive sort of exhibit? Uh, wow. Well, you really need to take each fair on its own there in terms of evolution or shifts because there's so many fairs and they're so different and it's kind of like food everyone has its own local flavor 
Um, so like the core, like make a fair Bay area, the core has always been hands on experience from the very beginning. But if you look at some of the other fairs, you know, some of them were born out of like a science center or a school library or something. And it takes them a while to kind of come into that. But the core of Maker Faire really is this interactive hands-on experience. Um, ideally, ideally, everything at the fair you would in some way interact with and be able to mess with. Um, and it's a, it's a real struggle internally, just a little bit of inside baseball. It's a real struggle when you have like a vendor that wants to participate and you want their money because maker fairs are expensive to run, right? Yes. But they don't get that aspect of it. So they bring a table and they put, you know, some pens with their name on it on the table and a calendar and a bucket of candy and they think that's good enough. And it's really difficult sometimes to get them to understand. Like, I'm assuming Briggs and Stratton was a sponsor here. Um, but they got it. They nailed it, right? So yes. then I'm going to take that example now yeah. to other people and be like, look, this is like a good example how you may not do something that fits it, but you can still find a way to be interactive. Um, yeah. So shifting gears a little bit, yeah. what has you, Caleb, excited about making right now? So not make your community. Oh, boy. So what am I into? I'm like a... I have a short attention span and I flutter around like a butterfly in a garden. Right. So I bounce. So you're completely different than the rest of us. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I'm, I'm your typical makerspace junkie, right? I'm, I'm addicted to the high that you get on the first steps of learning something where you go from really horrible at something to not totally horrible at something. Right. And in the beginning, like if you were to chart, uh, uh, make a graph, of, of your skills increasing, right? There would be a curve to it that in the very beginning is real steep, right? And, and so you're getting all this like endorphin rush and, and feedback that, oh, that's so much better than the last one. And it feels wonderful. I'm addicted to that, right? Yeah. So I bounce. I bounce and bounce and bounce and bounce. So the, the last thing that I've been doing is I was learning hand engraving. Yeah, like in like what that you see on like. Fun to watch on Instagram. Oh, thank you. Like uh, <laughs> like like eighteenth century guns, like that kind of hand engraving or yeah. hobo nickels or something. Um, and I'm still doing that, but I've kind of my the curve has started to level out a little bit where I'm not good, but I'm not making those steps from like to oh, it's okay, you know. Yes. So so I'm not getting that constant feedback loop of positive you know, endorphins in my brain. So it's a little harder to make myself sit down and get better. And, uh, and I broke down and like went out and bought new toys and I started doing like calligraphy with, with the dip pins the you know, okay. And, and so I'm struggling to not t stray too far right now. I, I understand that very much. Cause I'm getting ready to dive into screen, screen printing. Yeah. I just screen printed shirts. Oh, like what is this? Two, two days ago. Oh, nice. Podcast, and Makers like, oh on tap. God. All the things I could make with this. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. All, the, the mystery is gone, and now I'm just like, oh. Uh huh. Yeah, so. Well, that's awesome. Well, thanks for hanging out with us. Well, thank uh, you. I won't take any more of your time because okay. there's well. a lot of stuff going on. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, thanks for having me on. Yep. Hopefully, again in the future. Okay. All right. So, Makers on Tap, this is Joe. Who am I talking to? My name is Jason Quayle. How's it going? Great. How much so? Um, I have had enough to drink to talk to random strangers and have them on our podcast. So Wonderful. I like being a random stranger. I'm doing pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> Where are you from? Uh, we drove up from Benville, Arkansas. Okay. How far away is that from Little Rock? Uh, it's um, three and a half hours south of us. Okay. So, so yeah. I, w I went to Little Rock to visit... Uh, maker space there that I can totally not remember the name of. Innovation Hub? Mm, no, it wasn't that generic. Maybe it was that generic. It's the only one in Little Rock. Okay, maybe it was that <laughs> space. Uh, I, go, I go there about once a year, so twice a year. It so. was a it was a neat space. It was like I felt like it was the right amount of commercial to still be able to maybe survive. It's. I would say that's exactly how it would be. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know the people that run it, so yes, it's yeah. exactly that math right there. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, <laughs> so, 
Um, I saw you walking around today. I never saw your booth, but I did see you riding or walking around with a giraffe riding a tricycle. Yes, his name is Norbert. <laughs> <laughs> I loved it. Thank you. He's a real crowd pleaser. I, I was stuck in a conversation. Otherwise, I would have came and talked to you and like interviewed you right then. But like from a distance, <laughs> I, I, I literally bent over laughing at how that's the, absurd it was. That's great. If it's not weird and obscure, there's no reason to make it. Yes. <laughs> yes. If it doesn't generate excellent conversation, like, yes. what's the point? Or the laughter and smiles, which is usual. And then there's that like one of three people that like just run the other way yeah. like they're just terrified of a giraffe on a tricycle they just run like i, I haven't i haven't made one of those projects that generates that yet <laughs> but I, one day it, yeah. i will get there but like right chris and i genuinely had a conversation for a few minutes like how there's not enough room for a person definitely how the the legs go backwards Okay. Giraffe's legs bend backwards, so that's like the indicator. Like the people that really look at it, the legs are the indicator that his his they're bending backwards, so there can't be a person in there. Okay, I and did. if they were, they'd be really tiny because <laughs> the <laughs> neck is like three feet long. Yes. <laughs> so yes, he's five foot tall total. So yeah. Yeah. So how does he work? Uh, he's so he is actually a big stuffed animal on top of a remote control tricycle. Okay. So the the secret is underneath the. Uh, back left wheel is a drill motor from an old cordless drill and it's uh, an RC transmitter receiver an ECS okay and, or ESC and then the um, that all goes back to my remote control okay and then there's a servo around the collar of the handlebars to give me my left and right okay so you there's 3D printed gears that give me my left and right on top of a servo that is next to or that is right behind the the you know, the handlebars. So the tricycle actually is what drives. It, it's what moves. The puppet on top that just sits there and really doesn't do anything is the giraffe named Norbert. Yes. Um, and then the the secret part about it is, and a lot of people don't catch on to this, is the controller is actually hidden inside of a 24-ounce coffee cup. <laughs> so if you were to look at it, it looks like I'm holding a Vente Starbucks cup. Okay. And squeezing the cup makes him go forward. <laughs> and then the bottom of the cup itself turns left or right to make Norbert go left or right. Oh, man. And I've gotten really good at just flicking it with my finger. Uh-huh. So it just looks like I'm holding a cup. And when people, like, look at me and they're like, are you the one driving it? I'll just take a sip of the cup and walk <laughs> by. <laughs> There's no liquid in there. But it weirds them out every time because at this point they're like it's autonomous <laughs> and then to just add fun to it I talk to it I was like Norbert go left and then I'll steer it left <laughs> Norbert go right Norbert we're heading towards there and then everybody around me is like wait is there a person in there I don't know now is it voice control is that it voice control so gotta add that little nuance of the voice um, I was downstairs you know to get on the elevator and I was like, Norbert, which elevator do you think is going to get here first? And I turned the wheel towards the left one. And sure enough, the right door opened. And everybody's there like, we got to watch this. I literally heard that behind me because we were like, we've got to watch this. And sure enough, Norbert was wrong. Yes. And so he turned and then he just rolled onto the thing. That's <laughs> wonderful. So I I love the, the, the little aspect of just screwing with people. Oh, yeah. You got like... He he's he was built to bring to maker fairs, but I didn't want everybody to automatically know he's run by me. Yeah. And he's got a 300-foot range. Oh, wow. So in the morning, I was able to get from one end of the hall to the other driving him before I started walking. And so people were really just, what like, their head turns were just beautiful. So um, what, is, what controls him? Uh, he's a, uh, the drill motors drive and then it's a regular everyday, uh, RC car setup. But like, what's the controller for it that's in the coffee cup? Uh, I literally chopped up an RC controller. I cut it up with a bandsaw and then rewired it back together. <laughs> <laughs> so the, so those, so those little, uh, gun trigger, um, those little gun trigger RC car parts. Yes. The the higher end ones, not like a off the shelf model, but like the ECS or ESC and all that stuff. They, um. They have that little 
tire on the side of them. Yes. So I cut that chunk out and put it on the bottom of the cup. Okay. And then I um, put the trigger inside the cup, so it's the squeeze mechanism. Yeah. And then the batteries and the and the little uh, board that you can fine tune everything, I hot glued to the inside of the cup. And then to give myself room for the batteries, I had to cut the bottom of the straw off and epoxy it to the top of the cup. So the straw still comes out of the cup, but inside there's no straw. And I just walk around with that. And it's got like a two-hour battery life, and he's got two batteries. I can go almost the whole day That's of, amazing. on and off. So he just kind of runs around. It's so it's like, it's like so low tech, <laughs> but like also great. Oh, like, yeah. 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 Version one was actually autonomous. I made a Raspberry Pi. I made an autonomous. Kids are faster than sensors. Yeah. The sensor acknowledged that the kid was there and still ran into the kid. So I'm like, okay, we can't do this. <laughs> so I dumbed it down a lot. And then I said, well, now I've got to be there. Yeah. You know? So somebody said I should do FPV and just drive it from the other side of the building. I was like, I might one of these days just put a yeah. little camera in his chest and drive around. <laughs> yeah. Because kids automatically think it's automatic because I... Or, I will stop whenever they get in front of it. And then I'll like my wife's with me. I'll have her or somebody that I'm with say, go tell the kid to tell it to go stop left and right. Yeah. And so the kid will stop in front of it and then they'll say, tell it to go. And they'll like, Norbert go. And then I'll go. <laughs> Norbert stop. And then I'll stop. And Norbert left and they'll go left and so on and so forth. That's amazing. So, so Real quick, two things. Is this your first Milwaukee Maker Fair? This is my first Milwaukee Maker Fair. Thoughts? I, I, I've already talked to the people that put it on. I honestly think it's probably the best one I've been to in a very long time. The diversity of projects here, the diversity of the makers, show and tell, is vastly more than some of the... I've been to Kansas City a bunch of times. I've been to Tulsa. I mean, I've been to a lot of Maker Fairs. This is my 19th in a row. And this one is just the diversity. Yeah. I treat Maker Fairs like baseball cards. You know, got it, got it, need it, need it, got it, got it. Yeah, and yeah. But in Maker Fair, it's like seen it, seen it, did it, seen it, did it, did it, seen it. And this one, it's like, that's amazing, that's amazing, that's amazing. So they knocked it out of the park. Did you get to see the Tesla Coil Knights? I have not seen the Tesla Coil Knights yet. Like uh, I didn't get over there with Norbert fast enough. Um, but I have seen those types of things, so I'm anxious to go over and see them. Make an effort. They really amped up the the display this year. That was a great pun. And it's, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or, or a bad plan. I don't know. I don't know. Amps and Tesla <laughs> coils. Like, <laughs> <laughs> um, and then Milwaukee Makerspace. Is this your first time here? Uh, yeah, it's my first time in Milwaukee altogether. Oh, and, gosh, yes. Um, I was telling my wife earlier, I was like, I have access to all these tools. Most of them are in my garage. Laser cutter, CNC's, everything. And I would, she'd still have to come see me here. Like I would probably just live here and hang out. So yeah, this space is incredible on a level that I have not found an equal yeah. to. Like, There's like three, like the lowest number I've counted is three of everything. Yeah. There's like, like three laser cutters, three, <laughs> and then there's other things like there's. There's like 10 mils, yes. like metal, like, holy cow, that's a lot of mils. D did you see the angle grinder aisle? Yes, there's just or an aisle of angle grinders, <laughs> polishers, sanders, grinders, polishers, sander, grinder. Like, the whole area is just one gunmetal gray. On the, <laughs> yes. Like, everything's gunmetal gray in that area. They're obviously well-loved. So. Yeah. Do you guys have any questions? Totally monopolizing the interviews. All right. Well. <laughs> Um. Yeah. Thanks for being on. And thank you. I'm not going to take up any more of your night. Not weird. No, you're good. Thanks. <laughs> thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. And who are you again? Jason Quayle. Can people find your projects anywhere? Uh, yeah. On Instagram is my big like portfolio. Okay. What? And it's uh, at tinkering underscore guy. Okay. Awesome. Thanks. Thank you. All right. So this is Joe with Makers on Tap again. Who are you? I am Zyla Foxlin. What a cool name. Thank you. Thank you. It's not as high Scrabble scoring as you would think, though, unfortunately. <laughs> X's are only eight points. <laughs> so we literally just met. I have no idea who you are or why you're here. Same. <laughs> Same. <laughs> so I'm Joe. We run a makerspace called, or makerspace, a podcast called Makers on Tap. We drink and talk about making stuff. And it's good because I've been drinking. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I make uh, stuff. <laughs> and so have we. <laughs> and, and Yes. Uh, um, so we're here interviewing people from Maker Faire, uh, finding out about their projects and trying to get them more exposure. 
and just trying to meet more cool people. So awesome. who are you? What do you make? Yeah, so I'm Zyla. I'm the executive director of a nonprofit based out of Cleveland, Ohio called Beauty in the Bolts. And our mission is to lower the barrier to entry for girls and minorities in making and in engineering and creating. Um, but we're here at Maker Fair with one of our programs called Princesses with Power Tools. So right now um, we have a fleet of three volunteer princesses who have been teaching kids how to use their first power tool all weekend. That's awesome. Thank you. That's especially near and dear to my heart because I have two daughters Love and it. that are super into making things, super into art. Yes. And Good parenting. I, I'm just trying to get them on board for everything. And so far, it's it hasn't been trying. It's like trying to keep them out of things. Out of trouble, <laughs> right? Yes. Yeah. So, Absolutely. Uh, but a lot of kids, especially girls, don't get parents like that. And something that shocked me when I founded the program is like I thought that our job was going to be to, like girls were being conditioned by society and by the toys and all that jazz into thinking they can't make things. But no, it's like a lot of times it's the parents that are conditioning yeah. the kids. And we've had girls walk by and be like, ooh, mommy, like I want to do that. And the mom will straight up look their kid in the eyes and say, no, leave that for your brother. Um, however, the, the good thing about our scenario is that then the, the daughter goes, no, that's a mermaid. I love mermaids. <laughs> um, but anyway, then the mom ends up in this like paradoxical like dissonance in their of their beliefs. Like, okay, I've been encouraging my daughter to be pretty like a princess, but now, now what do we do? <laughs> yes. So that's how we get them. Usually we win. Yeah. Yeah. So one thing that's very awesome that what you're doing. So I actually went to your booth earlier this morning oh, cool. and I kind of played dumb. I'm okay. like, I don't know how to use a screwdriver or mm -hmm. And I know how to use a drill, but because we do we do the Maker Fest each year, I'm like this is a perfect a perfect exhibit to have at, at our at our Maker Fest. So, for one thing, I love the idea of just teaching just the basic stuff of just using the power drill because I don't know what else you guys do. What other types of skill based things do you guys have? You know, do you have any other exhibits that you do for events? Yeah, our top two event exhibits are Princesses with, with Power Tools, which is pretty much like all of our Maker Fair events and then sometimes we get asked to do like women in tech events or get girls involved in coding and stuff where we'll do Arduino, we have an Arduino 101 um, traveling kit as well. Um, that one is not princesses, it's typically like the kids are a little older, they're trying to be cool, cooler, um, <laughs> but uh, we, those are our two big traveling ones. Um, but the other like kind of half of the organization is that we have a YouTube channel that is all female taught machine shop tutorials or project tutorials. Um, and one of the things that we, obviously as a nonprofit, we talk a lot about getting girls involved in STEM, but on YouTube, on YouTube, we are really just trying to show it. So like if a girl types in how to solder, they just find a girl teaching them how to solder. They're not like finding a girl who's telling them that girls should be soldering, right? And I think there's like a really big difference because girls don't necessarily, like when you're young, you don't know that there are no girls in the field, right? Um, but if you're just shown them over time, then, you yeah. know, it'll really seriously change. So what's that channel called? It's called Beauty in the Bolt, which awesome. is the same as our nonprofit name. Yeah. Because we're really creative. <laughs> <laughs> the YouTube channel came first, for the record. Consistency and branding is important. Exactly, exactly. Yes. And you, you know, we got the Beauty in the Bolt and the Princesses with Power Tools. Like, it's, it's some, some amount of longevity there. I love it. So, um, do you guys do anything locally? Like, do you, are you part of a makerspace or are you part of anything else locally? Yeah, so we have been based out of um, this makerspace in Cleveland called Thinkbox for the last couple years. Um, and we actually just moved this weekend to uh, a different building called Ingenuity Cleveland. Okay. Um, Cleveland Ingenuity. And it's like a arts warehouse um, that has this sort of like Burning Man style festival every year. And so we kind of thought it would be fun to be surrounded by like that kind of creative people and be able to shoot at all hours yes <laughs> in like whatever and do whatever we wanted like so there's some more freedom there but we're still tied to the university makerspace awesome yeah there, being part of an artist community like that um is definitely a lot more freeing a, yeah. at our makerspace we we try to be as limited less as possible so like 24 7 and everything but yeah we we've tr been interested in moving to some spaces that are like, well, you know, we don't really want you around after 10, and we're like, nah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. And it's kind of interesting. I think that makerspaces can go one of two directions. In, and the, so the other thing that we do is makerspace consulting, particularly in how to make your makerspace more inclusive. Um, oh, we things, need that. Yeah. One of the things that I've seen 
in a lot of the spaces is you have the yes spaces and you have the no spaces. And so ones that typically have like aggressively high funding goals and are built by modern architects with like, you know, boards of directors who are trying to just raise more money and look good on a university or on a for-profit space that they're associated with, um, they tend to be no spaces, whereas spaces that are born collaboratively and organically from like the, a community tend to be yes spaces, where like if you spray paint in the wrong place and you make a boo-boo and like leave something on the floor, right? you're, you're not going to be kicked out, you're not going to get in a ton of trouble, you might be told, please don't do that again, yes. that sucks. <laughs> um, but it's that's that you know there's a difference there yes very much so i'm glad that you're not the only one with that experience uh, <laughs> uh. <laughs> jinx yeah <laughs> well you owe me a lathe inflation oh snap oh, no. i need a lathe oh no i need two lathes damn it um <laughs> Well, this is super fun. So people can find you on YouTube, on yes. Beauty and the Bolt. Anything yeah. else? Instagram, Twitter, Instagram, whatever. Instagram, Beauty and the Bolt. Um, Twitter, our Twitter game is really bad. My Twitter game is okay. I'm at Flying Robot Girl on Twitter. Okay. Um, but Beauty and the Bolt on Instagram and YouTube is kind of our big two. Awesome. Thank you for taking the time to hang out and talk to me. Um, of course. Thanks for having me. Thanks yes. for letting me sit on the table. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Always. Uh, Not that podcast listeners needed to know that. They did. They did. They, we needed to paint a descriptive picture of the room uh, for everybody to hear. So thank you so much. Love it. All right. All right. All right. So this is Joe with Makers on Tap. Who are you? Hi, Joe. Uh, my name is Eden Taylor. I am an uh, industrial designer and maker and general creative person. Awesome. And, yeah. So we literally just met. Yeah, uh, I I've have never spoken to you except for maybe two words yeah. before just now. So here we <laughs> so, are. So what do you make? So uh, I am the founder of a new startup uh, here in Milwaukee called Studio Dross. Uh, okay. Essentially, uh, it's a very fresh startup, so uh, only have like two or three posts on Instagram at the moment trying to get our, our going, but basically what Studio Dross is is a uh, ecologically beneficial uh, design brand, which means uh, essentially our goal is to create products, generally home goods, uh, made entirely from waste stream materials and recycled materials, and essentially as a result of creating products, we're actually cleaning the environment as a result rather than polluting okay. the process of making. Okay. So, man, there's so many questions I have now. Um, give me an idea of some of the waste stream products that you're utilizing. Yeah, so that's kind of something that uh, we're in the process of establishing right now. Uh, being so close to Lake Michigan, I'm generally focused a lot on our waterways, uh, okay. Lake Michigan and, and whatnot, any of the waterways feeding into it. Uh, so, you know, oftentimes we're reaching out to various beach cleanups and, um, you know, plastic-free groups within the city, okay. trying to, you know, kind of find people who are already gathering uh, materials out of the environment, and then ideally we can collaborate with them and start making products from what is essentially trash. I like to think of trash as kind of a fresh material yeah. rather than trash. Yeah, it's or found garbage. materials. There, um, there's a really cool cleanup effort that's happening in like the Baltimore area where they have these giant robot things mm -hmm. in their um, like waterway like dock areas. Yeah, it has like a like a little elevator escalator sort of thing yes. that collects materials out of the harbor. Yeah. yeah. I saw one of those for the first time last year and it was just like blown away by one the insane amount of trash that they pick up in a small amount of time. Like, oh yeah, it's intense. Like how are we generating that amount of plastic into our waterways and A thinking that's okay and B ignoring it everywhere that doesn't have these cool little cleanup robots and like where does that trash go next? Right, exactly. And that's the thing is, you know, oftentimes we don't see it. We put it in a trash can and then someone takes it away and we don't really know where um, things go. And, you know, we're often buying materials that are made from virgin or buying products that are made from virgin materials, whether that's, you know, brand new plastic or whatnot. Um, and obviously that's necessary in particular products, but in a lot of products that are around today, I think that most things already exist. And, uh, yeah. you know, we can take what exists and repurpose them and change them and make new products. 
So you said you have a lot of, you're still in the process of coming up with products, but maybe what do you see being your first like big idea as a company? Yeah, so overall, uh, right now we are working with primarily plastics. Uh, we're also hoping to get into more waste stream materials such as, for instance, coffee grounds, you know, a very popular material, they're everywhere. Uh, you know, you can perhaps use it for a fertilizer, but you could also perhaps press it into a sheet, which then can become any real material. Uh, right now, we're focusing on plastics with uh, some of the machines that uh, have been made by the group Precious Plastic. I actually spent yeah. a few months uh, in the Netherlands not too long ago uh, working with pr the Precious Plastic team on the oh, version nice. 4 machines. Uh, so if you're not familiar with Precious Plastic, Precious Plastic is a collective of people who every year uh, put out new versions of machines which help people to recycle and manufacture plastic products all around the world. So you're able to uh, build these machines very simply uh, and create your own small business. So um, I was there a few, a few months ago and learned quite a lot. And now that I'm back in the States, I'm kind of starting with those machines and then building off of it. Awesome. We actually had someone in our makerspace try to make the precious plastic shredder. Oh, wonderful. And it is surprisingly hard to find a local person to water jet your blades. <laughs> right, yeah. yeah. That was like the biggest challenge. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I, he's still working on it. That's how hard it was. Yeah, there's, uh, there's quite a lot of new, ex really exciting things coming out. There's a really huge uh, sheet press, which is what I mainly worked on, uh, full four foot by four foot sheets. So, it, you know, we can start to build into our existing ways of manufacturing, you know, just replace it with the plastic sheets instead of whatever it is that you're currently using. Nice. So is this your first Milwaukee Maker Fair? Uh, yes, it is, actually. So I actually grew up uh, just in the suburbs of Milwaukee okay. and uh, spent a few years in Chicago, came back for work, and um, I actually have just recently joined the Makerspace only a few months ago, uh, okay. mainly in order to have access to all of the amazing machines that and all of the amazing people in order to build these machines and start to you know, CNC aluminum molds for plastic injection and to build said shredder and whatnot. Um, and people have been really helpful and really amazing. So, What's your favorite part of joining a makerspace that you didn't expect to happen? That's, That's a, a good question. <laughs> it's a really good question. Something I didn't expect. You know, I think it's, it's probably just the people overall. Um, you know, people are always willing to help, always willing to... Um, throw in a hand if they have some sort of knowledge. Um, if you have a question, you can just ask anybody and they'll be like, oh yeah, Bill's really good at that. Or you should talk to Tom or whoever. Um, both of both of which are two people that have been immensely helpful to me in the past couple of months uh, getting started with our projects. So That's awesome. Yeah, it, It's fun to meet people who just recently joined a makerspace yeah. and ask that question because that's almost always the answer. It's That's like, I didn't expect to meet people that were incredible. <laughs> I mean, like, I expected to meet people that were incredible, but I mean, just the the amount that people are willing to give yeah. has been really nice. Yeah, that part. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we're like a little community. And that's something that uh, was really amazing at my time at Precious Plastic because I met all these amazing people from all around the world who had all these really interesting but similar mindsets. And, you know, you kind of get that in makerspaces as well. So, you know, I'm a traditionally trained industrial designer, you know, went to art school and everything and worked in the industry and now I'm kind of doing my own thing here. And it's that's, been really great. Yeah, that, that's super cool. Um, where can people find your stuff? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, again, Studio Dross. Uh, so Dross, D-R-O-S-S. -S. You can just like Dross off of when you're casting metal or whatnot. That's where we kind of got the name. Okay. Uh, so Studio Dross on Instagram and StudioDross.com as well. Okay. So things are really just kind of starting out, but we're getting moving a little bit more quickly here. Excellent. And if you're looking for me specifically, my name is Eden Taylor, Eden-Taylor.com. You can see some some of the stuff that I've made in the past as well. So yeah, but follow Studio Dross on okay. Instagram. What's one of your favorite personal things that you've done? Oh, geez. Uh, I recently designed uh, oh, yes. uh, from yeah, all the way from scratch. Uh, that was Chris's question, and I didn't realize it. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Sorry, Chris. <laughs> he, he is he is here, yeah, and he's Chris flipping me off table, right now. <laughs> so we're ignoring him, apparently. Hi, Chris. I also just met Chris like five minutes ago. So, 
yeah, so I recently redesigned uh, the board game Catan, Settlers of Catan, from absolute scratch. Uh, one of the things, generally, I, I play Settlers of Catan quite often with my friends, but people drink wine and we have cats, and so there's often some issues with a cardboard built Settlers of Catan game. So I built it entirely from scratch uh, with embedded magnets and um, it's wine and cat proof, totally waterproof. Like it took Excellent. a while, but it's it's really beautiful. Really uh, works a lot better than what it, like. So it, what got you into? Have you always been in the board game scene, or have you loved making stuff for that? Or are you like I'm going to go down this around. path? Really, I jump around. <laughs> like I've done jewelry in the past. I've done like large tile wall installations. Uh, you know, I've. I really, I really love making stuff. I'm, you know, here I've been learning to work with metal a lot more, um, which is kind of new for me personally. Um, so, I really jump around. If you like look at my website, you'll see like there's board games, there's bathroom sinks, there's from my old job, there's um, furniture, lighting. Like I really do everything. So, what was what was one of, of those? None, but a, a generalist, yep. as they say. I'm not sure what the phrase would be. <laughs> Jack of all trade, master of none. Yes, yep. that's it. Thank what was you. one of the first things that, like, when you when you really started out as a kid, like, you were like, this is, this was my first making experience. Like, what was that spark that really drove you? I don't know. I've always kind of been pretty creative. Like, you know, always drawing on things, doing a little pottery stuff. When I was, like, you know, seven or eight, my I wanted to be an architect. That was my thing. Yeah. For some reason, everyone's like, I want to be a firefighter. I want to be an architect. So... Um, always kind of done that before. No, absolutely. You're good. <laughs> You're good. Cool. I like. Thank you for. Oh being yeah, the thank you very much. This is great. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, this has been another interview at Maker or at Milwaukee Maker Fest. Um, we'll have more in a few. Nailed it. Hi. So, uh, who are you, and, and what do you like to do? Uh, my name is Andrew Butchko. Um, I like to build things. I do a lot of electronics work, but I also have a lot of talents in woodworking and metalworking. So I got that whole jack of all trades disease. So I could like pretty oh, much yeah. do anything. So, so what space are you out of? I'm out of the Akron Makerspace in Akron, Ohio. So you know Devin? Yes. Yes, Dr. Bansaw. Yeah, we've been. Uh, yeah, he's on a big bandsaw <laughs> kick. Uh, it was anvils, then it was like what table saws, now it's uh, bandsaws. But I don't complain because he finds really good stuff at really cheap prices. So you need to hook up on tools. He's the guy to talk to. So he actually sent us the listing for the saw stop that our space just bought. Yeah. So he, cause I know you guys are looking for a saw stop for a little bit. And he's I know. Been, like, he's keeping an eye out for us as well. And so we actually got our saw stop off of something he found for us, which is great. I went online, did some Googling, and I found a decent price on it, but he actually found a cheaper price. I was like, damn. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like, that's the good stuff. He knows what to look for. So what do you, Andy, like to make? I, I like doing a lot of electronics. Uh, lately, I, I've been building DDR pads, and I'm kind of... Yes! Yeah. You were the guy with DDR pads? Yeah, the wooden DDR pads. Yeah! Yeah, they're made out of wood. <laughs> and, uh... Like originally, me and my friend, uh, we built two of them for ourselves. And like, we, I saw this software. It's free. It's called Step Mania, and you could download songs for it, and you can make your own songs. So like, there's all these. I'm like, this is cool. I wish I knew about this earlier. But we didn't have pads. So all we had was like the plastic one, and we tried playing on that, and it it sucked. And then we're like, well, we're in a makerspace. Let's just make some metal pads. And I'm like, that's that's a lot of work, a lot of metal. Um, let, let's find a tutorial. And uh, here online, some guy, uh, Monkey Fighter 13, he made them out of wood. I'm like, I could do wood. I'm like, what do you use for contacts? Oh, just two pieces of metal. I'm like, oh, well, we got metal. So <laughs> the, the the original the, the original pads are actually made out of what we had at the space. The uh, the contacts are made from strapping that you use for hanging pipes. The uh, the brackets to hold it together were uh, candy box covers that we cut into four. It just I'm what, so about this. It was so much fun. It was we stayed up all weekend. It was like a 36 hour long build, and and we had a working pad by the end of the weekend. And and the the cool thing was is like we were kind of in a down spot in our maker space at the time, so we had some fighting going on, and we just got, got rid of that. So everyone was still just just worn out, and we, we started doing that weekend build, and we just we just wanted pads to to play DDR. And all these, everybody else coming in saw our enthusiasm, and other people started helping. Other people started working on their own projects. So it was a really good like um, 
I guess, turning point. But yeah, if you watch one of the YouTube videos, that's us Sunday night. We finally got one up and running. And we were trying to play on it. It was, yeah, it was really it was, fun. It was by far like when I was walking through the makerspace or walking through the event today, um, just turning and seeing like, oh, there's a giant ski ball. And then looking over <laughs> and seeing a DDR like machine-esque thing going on was like, because I'm, I'm a huge like rhythm gaming nut. Um, oh, cool. I play a lot of like Dance Rush and um, some of the... Uh, wow, uh, pump it up, um, oh, yeah. and some of those. And so it's like, I love playing. And so seeing that was like, this is so freaking cool. Somebody actually made it. Because like, those machines are stupid expensive if you're oh, trying yeah. to get one. And so it's like, hats off to you, man. Like, that was an awesome build. And to see like how you guys did it was an incredible like build experience. So like, kudos. Uh, <laughs> yeah, those are actually, uh, I think it's number 30 and number 33. Uh, 32 got mixed up somewhere. But yeah, I've been building them and selling them because t- we, we made them and then we're like, hey, let's take them to that convention. And we, everybody loved it. It was like, and the original ones didn't have any foam inside, so they're yep. really loud. So they'll be walking around the convention. I'm like, guys, let me stop and check on my pads. I'll hold up my ear. And they're like, oh, I can still hear them. They're still good. They're so loud, but it was awesome. Yep. And like, people would camp out because they love playing DDR. And I'm like, you could do other things. Like, no, no, I want to stay and play DDR. I'm like, all right. And I'm like, this is. This would be a much bigger thing if people had access to better pads uh, at a good price. And, and so I'm I mean, like, I started making and selling I, them. I'm the king of getting sidetracked on this show. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, there's a whole reason why that is. And I could talk to you off mic about like Konami well, we'll, and we'll all their to, BS yeah. that like goes along with that. But it, it it's such a cool example of like a maker finding a need in the community and fulfilling it. And it's like... Again, hats off to you, dude. That was such a cool thing to see at the fair. And just, like, my my rhythm gaming heart, like, loved seeing that so much. <laughs> the the pads get a lot of slack online until about 9 o'clock, and then all the 12-year-olds go to bed. But then when people show up, they're like, oh, these things are legit. The, yeah. You can do, like, a level 16 on it and still pass, like, the level. I I'm was like, wondering, because, like, I saw, like, all I saw were some kids going on it. And I was like, yeah. I kind of want to, like, run over there, but... I don't want to take away from the kids. <laughs> You'll have to try them out. They're, it, the best way my friend explained it is like they're, they're like the mechanical keyboards of the DDR community. Ooh. Because you have to press it down yeah. to make the contact, whereas DDR, you have to drop your foot down and just touch yeah. it. So it's a different feeling, but that would be because like I'm so used to like the the you know like the side step and you kind of have it in both areas when yeah. you're like trying to do it. That like that seems so interesting, but I'm I'm really down you can still for it. bracket it, but you have to have kind of like a heel. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So you know, yeah, you know yeah. what I'm talking about. Yeah. <laughs> and if you need a babysitter, you teach the kids how to play it. They'll be like on it for like four <laughs> hours. No, um, I love it so. So, have you done any arcade stuff before this that you? Uh, yeah, I have a home built pinball machine. You a home built pinball? It's, Are you a masochist, my friend? <laughs> I, I do a lot. I do a lot. Uh, I started off because I wanted to do an arc noise style of pinball, and I'm like, well, I need to build this thing. Oh, what the hell is it? Oh, it's called a pop bumper. Yeah. Oh, this is going to take a lot of manufacturing. So I started off building pop bumpers to see if I can do those. Then my friend's like, oh, let's mount them up before you take it to this show. So we mounted on a piece of wood that was about the same size as a play field. Yep. And then we're like, oh, let's put some borders around it, make it so the kids could throw balls around on it. So it started off as a play field, and then we just kept adding and adding and adding. Now it's like a full-fledged pinball machine. And Jeez. like, I got to buy the electronics for it next. Like, There's a wiring harness in it, and there's right. just, just all a bunch of stuff going in. Like, we had it run in for the Detroit Maker Fair. Yeah. No safeties on it at all. <laughs> so they're telling people... Don't hold the flipper down. It lasted for like about four hours before we fried a coil, but it, they still had fun. Sounds about right. <laughs> I already I already replaced the coil, so I knew it was going to happen. It was just like, we don't have time to do it right, but we have time to at least hook it up. So here we go. So have you been at the booth all all today, or were you yeah. able to walk around? Okay, I got to walk around for like uh, half an hour at the end of the day, and there's some amazing stuff there. I was talking with the ROV guys because yeah. I'm actually planning a, a show for my YouTube channel. There's tunnels in Akron, and we want to explore them. I'm not okay. going in it. Yeah, the canal goes underneath the city, and it's all encased in like a two foot thick brick or an, um, c- cement tunnel. Okay. But if you go into the hotel, the bottom of the hotel's parking deck, you can see the top of it, and there's two pipes that are open to it. So we built custom selfie sticks and stuck them in there and filmed what was inside. 
So I'm all about to find some ghosts. <laughs> no, there was no ghosts, but there was a neat <laughs> waterfall at the one end. Oh, that's yeah. cool. So they, you wouldn't want to walk through it because there's a ten foot waterfall. Like, right. You would not get back out. But it, it's like we're like, okay, we need to send an ROV in there. So we started right. coming up with ways to do it. I'm like, it's two thousand feet long. Walls are two feet thick concrete. And it drops 194 feet in altitude from what we measured with our cell phones. So it's like, how the heck we do it? Ethernet cable only goes like 300 feet. Power of Ethernet only goes like, what, 500 or 800? I forget. But I'm like, how are we going to get video and all that stuff back? So I was like, oh, there's the ROV guys. What do you use for a tether? I need to know. <laughs> well, there's a couple other members at the space who are really intrigued about it. They helped me do the initial filming. Yeah. And I'm like, dude, like... If we can make this happen, I'm willing to throw 500 bucks at it over the next year to, to make an ROV. And like we found a fiber optic cable that gave me 500 meters or about 5,000 meters of a cable, Ooh. and it has Ethernet uh, converters on both ends. But it's 300 dollars of our budget, and it's like, <laughs> yeah, uh, that fiber is gonna eat up a lot. <laughs> but we uh, we grabbed like a three dollar camera that we had, put an SD card in it. Threw it in a, bo- a bottle. Like we're, we're looking for a bottle, and we, we need something to put the camera in that's big enough. Uh, this is the fun stuff we do at the space. It's this like, is a, this is like, such makery stuff. We're shopping. It's... We're shopping not for food. We're, uh, we're shop- sorry, I don't mean to yell. We're, we're shopping for a bottle. I'm like, well, here's a jar of mayonnaise it would fit in, but who's gonna eat all this mayonnaise? We have only found like a big jar of popcorn. I'm like, perfect. We just chowed down on popcorn. Yep. Stuck the yep. camera in there. Stuck a flashlight in there. Weighted it with some weights and put some foam in it, and then tied it to some fishing line and send it down in there. And I was like, it feels like it's still pulling. It feels like it's still pulling. Finally, after an hour, we're like, this isn't working. We pulled it up. We just got a big ball of, of string. Like, the fishing line got cut by the concrete. And I'm like, this is harder than it's going to look. Uh. And then we're looking. I'm like, I can see a light flashing down the tunnel, like 150 feet down in the tunnel. Yeah. Hey, there's a flash again. Like, the, the, the bottle got stuck in that big waterfall. And it was just <laughs> I'm like, this is going to be impossible because there's, what do they call it, a hydraulic jump? Yeah. It's stuck in that. I'm like, so we need we need an ROV with motors. and a- <laughs> You need a claw, my friend. <laughs> then the one guy's like, can we fly a drone in there? I'm like, until we lose signal. Uh, this, <laughs> That's, it's oh, a challenge. Man. And this is really, I'm like, and the cool thing is that if we do build one, it wouldn't be wasted on just that because there's a few other tunnels I know of. There's a, a secret river that runs through Akron that I've been documenting, which is kind of a hard one to do a video of because it's all encased underground. Yeah. So I, I might start to some more city officials. Uh, I asked the city officials, I'm like, hey, is there any access to the canal underneath the, the building? He's like, no, we don't go in there. I'm like, darn. I was, of course. Uh, of can course. I borrow the keys? I need to go do some filming. <laughs> no, that's, oh, man. That's... So this is like the exciting stuff I'm doing there. Um, other than that, I got a couple of videos on my YouTube channel of me moving my cars around because the city complained about those. <laughs> Sounds about right. Yeah, so I had to put it back in the garage, and the tow truck can only get it so far, and they need to move it another foot. So I'm like, I can't get up to it because it's all muddy there, but it's not muddy over there, so I need about 10 foot of difference. So I took a 4x4, four four, put like a, a little cup on the end of, out, of, out of wood so that it would fit over my ball joint on the tail hitch, and then put the car up on the street, put that 10 foot pole from the street over to my car in the garage, put it up to the frame, and I packed my car up to put... So it's a, it a big Fiero on a stick. <laughs> it worked. It worked. I was able to push the car the other foot and then put my door back in. <laughs> I think with that, like, please tell us where you can, we can find these videos oh. as well as your social. It, I'm on uh, YouTube. It's uh, Calvin the Destroyer, all one word. That's where I post a lot of my uh, channels and stuff. Um, uh, some of the shows I have is Wild Akron. Um, that's just mixed in with my regular channel because... I live in the city, but there's all these wild animals around me. And then I also have um, the underground stuff, which is coming together, which hasn't been released. Other than that, I have a lot of DDR videos. I do a lot of adventures. Like the, um, I'm a big brony, so I watch the My Little Pony stuff, and there's a lot of videos on those. And then I have slot car racing. And it's funny because I tease the slot car guys. I'm like, yeah, the brony videos are getting more popular than the slot cars. <laughs> but that's up, uh, yeah. up. And uh, there's a couple other things that are kind of random, like the, the Bitcoin stuff. I've been dabbling in that. So I want to do a few more videos on that stuff. I figured, like, I'm a big hardware guy. So I got a bunch of Bitcoin miners at home that I've dealt with and ran. And I, I have, like, one running right now just to try to clean up an account. But, yeah, there, it's a lot. Of, I love hardware. And it's seeing that stuff is just like, this is amazing. Like, this is actually forming 
these huge calculations right in my basement. Like this is like literally like 3,000 video cards in this one little box. No, absolutely. That's awesome. Yeah, one. All right. So, so which pony is your favorite? Um, Rainbow Dash, and I uh, also like Twilight. Mine is Rarity. All right. She's the best. Roll hoof. I've seen all the seasons. I, have, I still have to catch up on season nine. I've been busy with moving the makerspace, so I've been, like, lost in myself. <laughs> we're, we're, like, trying to find where we unpacked everything. Yeah, awesome. it's, it's good, though. We're moving from 3,000 square feet to 10. Yeah, yeah, we talked about um, that. That's awesome. That's yeah, so, so if you guys are ever in the Akron area, get a hold of us. We'll, we'll, we'll give, gladly give you a tour and show you around. And help you to escape the elevator. Yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's an old freight elevator, so you got to know what buttons to push, and they're not labeled very well. So, But other than that, um, I do have my website. It's uh, DS Prototyping. Uh, it's Dungeon Studios Prototyping, so it would be dsprototyping.com. And uh, actually, if you search for Andrew Bushko, you'd find me. And then I also have my other key phrase, which is A4S8B7, which will find like everything on me in social media. And all the memes I post on everybody else's channels. <laughs> memes are the best. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's for the space. Uh, we started a cool shit committee. I don't know, can we say shit on here? Uh, oh, yeah. Right. And we, we got this big space, so we want to decorate it and make it a lot of fun. Uh, a lot of spaces have this deal where there's like, donate here, and there's a hole. So you put the money there, and it trips the sensor, turns on a shot back, sucks the money up a tube, up into a big jar in the ceiling. And we're, we want to do the same thing. So we're going to copy that. Devin went, uh, Devin again, bought these blast plates from like a big storage tank. And they're like three foot diameter round domes. And they have the holes around the edge because it's basically like a pressure vessel. If it goes over a certain pressure, these discs will blow out. But he's got two of them. And when you put them together, it makes a giant UFO. So we're going to put a <laughs> tube down the bottom of the... Yeah, you know where I'm going with this. There'll be a tube coming out of the UFO. You put your money there, and it ducks your money up and into the UFO. And he, he, also, he bought some like little cows and stuff that we could put up in there, too. <laughs> Amazing. That's awesome. And it's a good thing to have because at the other places, we're, people just put money in it because they want to see it go. They, they had it with the lights in there. It'll light up. And they are like, give me another dollar. I want to see it again. It, Perfect. Well, Andy, thanks for being on the show. Oh, thank you for pleasure. having me. This is a great conversation. You definitely have to stop by, try some ski bowling and uh, the yeah. DDR. Uh, if you play DDR, the My Little Pony ones are where all the easy songs are. The awesome. Stay away from Windu Hates You and Undertales. <laughs> it, under uh, <laughs> it says it's a one. That's a lie. It's not a one. You will have a bad time. That's what they say. Yeah. <laughs> all right. All thank right. you, guys. Thanks. Check, check one. Check two. Good. Is that good? Yeah. Am I too loud? No, I'm off and loud. No. <laughs> okay. You're good. Um, so this is Chris. We're back um, at the Milwaukee Maker Space getting interviews from the Milwaukee Maker Fair uh, 2019. Um, just talking to all of the cool makers that we've met uh, so far. And you have just walked up. What is your name? Hi, I am Karen Corbeil uh, at the Milwaukee Maker Fair. I am helping run the Power Racing Series Power Wheels Races. Oh, which okay. I have been doing for about ten years. Jeez, that's all. Okay, so this is my this is my first year that I've actually been up here. Oh, um, many so, new exciting things for you then. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of cool stuff. Uh, that was one of the coolest things that I actually <laughs> got to watch because I was like blown away by everything that was happening and just was like, oh, like Star Trek. But then I started hearing them go off and like hearing the horn. And I was like, what is this? And I started looking. Immediately just was like blown away by all the power wheels. It it's started, like, stupid amounts of fun. And the most uh, yeah. disappointing thing about the series is all of the audience members that come up and go, can I drive? And we go, no, I'm sorry. Well, how do I get to drive? Well, you build one. And then yeah. they go, oh. So, I mean, let's go right into that. So what, what got you started into that? What, like, how did you guys build <laughs> something so cool? Uh, so the, the power racing series is the brainchild of the brilliant Jim Burke. Um, originally of Pumping Station One, and then he abandoned yep. all of us in the Midwest and <laughs> moved out to California. Yep. So he's the barrier now. Um, I uh, stumbled upon Jim. Um, I had an internship in Chicago in 2010, and that was going to be the first Detroit Maker Fair. And I am from Detroit, 
Fair enough. Um, and I uh, had a, an internship in Chicago that I was very bored at after hours. And I wandered into the local hackerspace because I had recently joined my hackerspace, I3 Detroit. And was looking for like-minded people uh, and ran into my friend, whose person is now my friend, Jordan. And he was like, hey, do you want to come have dinner with me and my roommate? And I met Jim. Uh, and we hung out a bunch. And then like two weeks later, he was like, wait, you're from Detroit. I'm like, yeah. He's like, there's going to be a maker fair there. I have this idea. Hey, are you any good at organizing things? And I'm like... Yes, and that's an understatement because <laughs> I'm an event planner Fair enough. Uh, and stage manager. Um, <laughs> and uh, so then he started telling me about this like crazy thing he wanted to do called the Power Racing Series uh, because there was first robotics, um, but it's so expensive to get into. Right. And so he wanted something that people could get into with a very low budget. And so... The, the budget the max budget on the cars is five hundred dollars, which has been tweaked over the years with technicalities. But you still can build a car for under five hundred dollars. Um, it is harder to like field a team for that much little, but it is completely possible yeah. um, if you're willing to put in the time and energy to to scrap everything together. But um, we just reached out to a bunch of hacker spaces and they showed up and. Other people just kept showing up to maker fairs and hearing about us, however, through their channels. And we just kept getting more and more people. And I think one year at Detroit, we had like 40 or 50 cars racing Jeez. in one weekend. It was insane. I, like just seeing how every like all the cars that were put together and everything that was going on today was such a cool. I, I have to say probably my favorite was the cat bus. Um, <laughs> cat bus rolling around was one of the coolest things because. I mean, I love Totoro, um, so that was just <laughs> awesome. Um, but what, like, what has been one of your favorites that you've seen oh, in the series? Oh man! Oh, I mean, like, I've been doing this for ten years. Yeah. Um. So before Cat Bus was going on two wheels, uh, there was a team out of Pittsburgh okay. from, ha from Hack PGH that uh, first they had the Hack Pittsburgher, then they had the Double uh, O Six. And Eli, who was their driver and builder, um, was, like, super committed always. So he would wear, like, a full suit in the, like, 90-plus degree, like, Detroit heat in yep. July, the end of July, racing his car with this thing. Um, they built a DeLorean. They vacuum-formed the body. Uh, and so the first year, he showed up dressed as Marty. Yes. And he... Um, <laughs> Chad came dressed up as Doc, and they did like a whole skit. Uh, there was a guy who showed up with a Chibi Miku van, and so there was this like white boxy Power Wheels van. Yes. So we had them get chased down by the Libyans. That was amazing. <laughs> and then the next year they came back and did Back to the Future, is it three? The Western. And they brought a train. <laughs> And it, I love uh, these people it already. Was not, it was not self motorized, but it could be the. They put a trailer hitch on their Power Wheels car, and they they hooked it to the train so it looked like the train was pushing the DeLorean, and they put dry ice in the smokestack so it looked like it was actually smoking. This is amazing. Yeah, oh, and he wore man. the whole like Serapi, yeah, uh, like poncho thing too. It was yeah, um, I just like the teams that because like so. One of the special things about the Power Racing Series is Moxie. I don't know if you guys saw that. Oh, but yeah. We have this board going around with buttons, one for each team. And so it's not just how fast your car is. It's how many Moxie points you get. And you earn those by being entertaining or cool or funny or just wrecking a lot. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, but so, uh, you know, we've, we've had a lot of teams over the years that just kind of ignored the moxie portion and they just kind of tried to over-engineer their cars and like they built really cool fast cars yeah but it was really boring because we used to have a, a moxie round that was like worth points and it, we always struggled to get teams to like participate in that and so my favorites were always the teams that just like threw Wait, everything in. in so we've got this team called lazy gecko they actually have they're fielding 10 cars this weekend they Sheesh. have almost they make up almost half of our field this year and <sighs> Uh, a few years back uh, at Mega Fair Detroit, uh, it was one of their first ones. They brought an ice cream truck, and they wore the cutest little like soda shop outfits and had a choreographed dance, and they had inflatable ice cream cones, and it was the cutest thing ever. And I am just like, 
I love you guys because you are so committed and you put so much work well, into this and you get uh, it. Like it's like they got the series because that's the yeah. whole point. No, you know? it's, oh, it's 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 the heart behind it. It's oh, the yeah. passion. It's just not the engineering. It's the yep. I want to create oh, something yeah. cool. Which, oh, uh, I will say I, I think one of my favorite cars was uh, I think it was my last my so I raced for three years. Uh, I yep. think it was my last year racing in New York. There was there was this like ginger dude that kind of looked like a leprechaun because he had like a chin strap red beard. But they built this. I mean, it was a dragon technically. <laughs> Okay. Um, and I think you stood on it to drive, uh, and just so kind of like this. leaned back and forth. Um, <laughs> but it breathed fire, and I didn't oh. really like breathe fire. But they had like a torch in the mouth that they would yeah. light, so it would be on fire as he was driving. And the kids now, like New York Maker Fair, has a lot of kids because it's at the Children's Museum. It yeah. tends to be one of the more family-friendly Maker Fairs. It's very family-focused. But man, those kids loved that <laughs> dragon i um, mean i think i think i ended up winning the the overall that race but it was real close and i think that was i think that was the first year and the first car that we had a moxie car like nearly win be but like place overall yeah. uh, by getting so many moxie points and i think that was the first time that people were like oh oh Oh, Moxie's really where it's at. Right. Um, and then a few years ago, we changed the the point structure, and we kind of like spread out the the race points a little bit better. And then uh, Milwaukee Makerspace showed up with a fiberglass wiener mobile that you like straddle to ride. Yep. With a I saw bike that handle sticking up top, and that thing just destroyed everyone in points <laughs> because that season happened to be kind of heavily weighted with Moxie. Yep. And they just took home everything. That's amazing. Now, I did see a YouTube episode where William Osmond won Moxie by bribing children with money while driving around in a shopping cart. Is that cool? That is not. Okay. Yes. <laughs> yes. So, um, so back in the years when we had an actual Moxie round. So we've always had a 75-minute endurance race or a long endurance race. And we've always had sprint races that last 10 to 15 minutes, and then we adjust how many laps for like the length of the laps at that track. Um, but our third event has always, it's kind of been ever evolving, because we've always just been trying to find something that like entertains everybody, that the, like, the drivers have fun doing, um, and just like works. And so we used to do drag races, which like with how short our straightaways are, <laughs> they got boring real fast. Um, we also, there may have been an incident with a crash that made it so that we stopped doing that. And also we have a fuse rule now so that you can't have your car too powerful. Um, so after that, we started doing the moxie rounds and they would do skits. And like, it was pretty good the first like year or two, like two thirds to three quarters of the cars would do something. Um, but then it just kind of started petering off and like there were too many cars and it took too long. We didn't care. Um, so now we do a relay race, which we started this year, which actually has been kind of awesome. We're going to do it tomorrow morning at 11 if you want to check it out. We will be there. It's gonna be it's gonna be pretty sweet. <laughs> um, yeah, no, with Moxie, kind of kind of anything goes. Uh, we, yeah, we have had so during the Moxie rounds, we would pick like three kids out of the audience, and uh, they would each give points on a scale of like one to ten uh, for each performance of each of each car. And uh, yeah, there was it was completely free game for those judges. <laughs> like and a lot of times teams would be like, well, we didn't prep anything, so I'm just gonna give ten bucks to all the judges. The kids are like, yeah, <laughs> or they'd like get, bring them a bag of candy. Dude, those kids like made out like bandits. They'd get candy and like cool props and stuffed animals. Oh and, my like, god! Here, I'm just gonna give you my medal that I just want. Like, dude, those kids like got everything. The hilarious thing is that like the point spread for the from those judges was so small because I mean like they're kids and they'll be like nine eight nine I hated you so seven I loved you so nine and then you get the kid that's like I give him a three that one's a ten or oh, maybe a six just because oh my gosh um, and so but like it's 30 points so, I mean like there's only like five points difference but then you've got the moxie board going around that like everyone else is pushing and you get way more points from the moxie board than you get from those three kids yeah. so honestly it's kind of wasted money <laughs> <laughs> but you know that's that's neither here nor there. Uh, but we've moved on from the Moxie. We still have the Moxie board, but we've moved on from the Moxie skits to the relay race. Uh, we need to figure out a new medal scheme, though, because we realized in Detroit we had one medal uh, for each team because we had like gold, silver, and bronze, right? 
except that our relay teams are like four or five cars from four or five different teams. Oh. So now we need to come with like mini medals or like maybe maybe like a like a Eucharist style where it's like perforated so we can like break it into pieces and like give a so piece it's like a to best friend team. necklace. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> But then we have to figure out, is it split to four, five? I don't know. Figure out how everyone gets an equal piece. I love this. Because we never know how many cars are going to show up or how many are going to last. Because, like, we had, I think, like, 26 or 27 cars on grid at one point. I don't think we're going to have, like, maybe 20 (laughs) tomorrow. Either they died or all the teams left. So what you should do is you should make the metal one piece, but laser cuttable. Because I've never been to a Maker Faire that never didn't do have metal. a laser cutter never do somewhere. Metal. That's well, I mean, like <laughs> now there's a ton of lasers. There didn't that did not used to be the case. Right. Yeah. People did not bring their laser. Their their precious precious laser cutters did not leave the shop. Yeah. Because they were so finicky that you didn't ever want to <laughs> move them. Like you wouldn't want to breathe on them wrong and have them break. Yeah. Now people got glow forges all up and down everywhere. Yeah. I saw. Yeah, I saw a glow forge there today. I saw quite a few laser cutters and I was like, oh, it's like 3D printers now. Weird. They're like everywhere. Yeah, I, I saw an epilogue at a show a few years ago, and I was like, "Really? You're, you're going to bring a thirty thousand right? dollar laser to a was maker it fair?" Epilogue that brought it? <laughs> no, it was a maker space, and I was like, oh, "You are ballsy, right? You're brave. <laughs> I wouldn't. I would not bring that out in the open where people that don't understand laser cutters could touch it." And yeah. uh, the exhibit that they had was super cool. They had kids drawing on a tablet, and then they had somebody who was immaculately amazing at Inkscape vectorizing those kids drawings real nice. quick and then like laser cutting it out I was like that was super cool but damn um, well I mean you wouldn't even ha- All right, I'm, gonna, <laughs> I'm like you wouldn't have to vectorize it only if you want to cut it all the way through you could just etch that design and then you don't have to do anything to it yeah no design just you just have them draw it you throw it in as like a bitmap and you just etch it yeah. That takes a lot longer, though. So yeah. I see why you'd want to vector it, because then you can, like, vector edge, where you, like, cut it a low power. They, they yeah. were ripping through the cube. They, yeah, they must it have been. It was fast. I yeah. was blown away at that dude's vector skills. Nice. Um, so the one question that I really have, okay. and this is to you Hit guys, me. kind of. Oh. What, okay. what tips do you have for a new team that Ooh. has never done Power Wheels Ooh. racing but wants to? Um. Don't don't try to build the the fastest bestest car. Just try to build one that's reliable. Uh, yeah, take your moxie seriously. Uh, figure out something that's not like weirdly niche. Find okay. something that's got good appeal that is very recognizable and plain. Um, like one of our cars, it was like a, a a pink Corvette, and she put like a yellow star on it. She did a Steven Universe thing, and like she did her moxie skit uh, playing, um, you know, like stronger than you. Which was amazing, except that like over our speakers, you can't really hear it because that song is not a strong, like, it's not a good party song, so it's not good for speakers. Yeah, um, and and because like unless she like fashioned her helmet to look like garnet, like you wouldn't. It's not super recognizable. Yeah, I have um, no idea what you're talking about. Right. It's, yeah. Uh, but so like, but like for example, uh, Fubar from well, where are they from? New Jersey. Um, they had this like ugly green truck for years, and they're like, "Well, we should probably repaint this." And then rather because people kept joking that it looked like crap, so instead the next season they just printed out a bunch of giant poop emojis and stuck them all over their car. Nice. Uh, yes. Dude, do you know how much moxie that got? Uh, Simple <laughs> to the point. Everyone loves poop emojis. Apparently. Has anybody done a Nyan cat car? I was just talking about this earlier. I think so. So I haven't been to all of the races all the time ever because I like having a life outside of Power Wheels. And I did that for a couple years where I went to all of the races and it's it's a lot of time off uh, or it's a lot of money because then you have to fly everywhere. And then if you're like trying to do anything, then you also have to like haul gear and it's not fun. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, I think there was a Nyan cat. We were trying to figure out, I think there was a piece of cake. Uh what the heck else? We've got it. So the oh, we do have some one of my favorites this year, uh, but only in Detroit because the the woman that is part of the team didn't show up uh, from Milwaukee. Um, they have a horse, but she's Doctor Quinn Medicine Woman, and she Ooh. had the full cosplay. <laughs> so this chick is wearing a petticoat in in the July Detroit I heat. Love it. it was amazing, and the <laughs> cute little hat and everything. 
Yes. It was, man, yeah, again, awesome. commitment. Now, like, just that horse going around, like, he's not even just like a cowboy or something. And they're still like Dr. Quinn, and it's weird because they don't actually have Dr. Quinn. It's just a horse. So, yeah, so there's, you got, sometimes you got those package deals. But uh, last year, Milwaukee threw together a car and didn't have any mox ideas and somehow last minute uh, decided to make it a unicorn and man that was an ugly unicorn that they just like (laughs) threw together last minute it was awful but the crowd ate it up because it was just like the idea of unicorn so they brought it back this year but man that unicorn is beautiful like it's all like made of like polygons and stuff but man i saw that i saw pictures of it in kansas city when it was like all freshly painted well duct tapes i think i don't know if it's painted i think it's covered in white duct tape but um yeah that thing brand new it was just like gorgeous man when people put in the effort like like kappas i saw it half carved at like sitting at ps1 they spent a lot of time on that uh and freaking gary the snail so i am not a spongebob fan i don't care again like You've got your cartoon <laughs> theme there, yeah. but also you've Jake got Garrett a snail Garrett. whose eyeballs are up on these giant stalks that are just going like, blah, 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 like, like the, bobbing like, all over the place. They're proper googly eyes, yeah, but giant. <laughs> so the funny thing was, is in Detroit, he originally had them uh, anchored with PVC up the middle, but they were too floppy, and they kept because like that's a giant chunk of foam, not like pool noodle foam, like pink carving foam. And uh, they kept, they were too floppy and they kept like bonking other people in the head and like no injuries, but it was a little annoying. And so one of them eventually got broken off because it like, it would flop over and not immediately flop back. So this race, he's got carbon fiber tubes up there. (laughs) So they like bubble back and forth, but they're like, they recover. They're they're, like spring loaded. It's good. It's good. Thanks, Tip, thanks for being join on. the Power Racing Series. It's the oh most fun. Also, and honestly, you really meet the best people. I thought it was hilarious uh, how high the correlation is between people that are committed enough to complete a Power Wheels car and the kinds of people that run maker spaces. There's a lot of correlation there. Damn it. I discovered. Yes. I didn't want to hear that. Sorry. <laughs> There's also ridiculous people like uh, Banana Car. In Michigan, uh, I'm yeah. So I'm Nicor Detroit. Uh, They only ever raced in Detroit because they did not care. Uh, It basically moved. It was I'm trying to remember what it originally was. It was six feet tall. It was a traveling tiki hut. Uh, It had like thirty inch speakers, two on like one on either side. Uh, It was just a traveling party, and under the hood was a margarita blender. Yeah. Uh, and Brandon would just like show up with a beer in the morning and be like, let's do this. Yes. Uh, and just like cruise. It was just a cruising party around the track. <laughs> just like cruising around, chilling, like always a drink in his hand, like driving in the other. Are, just, are, it was the best time. Are there rules against drinking while driving in Power Wheels racing? Yet. No, no, is, no. Is this, a, no. is this a don't make me make more rules situation? Basically, yeah. yeah. We've definitely had teams drink. Um, <laughs> We've never had a problem with someone like being too drunk to drive because also like you sign a waiver and it can be real dangerous. Like we've never had any like major accidents. We've had some accidents, but no like major accidents. But I think that's because everyone understands like I hacked this together and I know how unreliable it is because I'm the one that made it. So it's not like, oh, yeah, I'm going to go get on like a car that professionals designed and it should be fine or like a bicycle. And no, like I'm designed and made this. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah I'm going to make sure I'm mostly sober while I drive this. Yeah, it's, like, it's like my drift trike that every time I got on it, I was like, okay, I might die now. Okay. Yeah. Hey, can I try that thing? Uh, well, I'm going to give you this five-minute disclaimer, and then I'm going to leave it up to you. Also, you have to sign this waiver first. Yeah. Right. <laughs> if you slide too back in, far back in the seat, you might get maimed by a chain. I don't know. <laughs> I, I literally have a scar on my leg from a uh, San Mateo two years ago. Um, there was this beautiful car that someone made. It was laser-cut cardboard layers glued front to back like for the full car body they cut so each layer it. out of cardboard <laughs> it was so beautiful it. but it was a crazy cart so for those of you that don't know what a crazy cart is it basically uh the regular wheels are all casters and there is one large drive wheel in the middle <laughs> yes yes frequently between your legs <laughs> 
uh, that actually like propels and steers the car. So uh, the casters keep you from falling over. Uh, but when you turn, it, you kind of, you'd like kind of drift for a while before you actually like turn. So it took me a, like a lap or two to get used to it. But like I was fine, uh, and there's video of this. But so I took one turn, and this particular crazy cart was uh, like belt driven as opposed to chain driven, and I turned really hard, and it threw the belts. Remember how I said the drive wheels between your legs? So it Oof. took probably like an inch, inch and a half, ch like round chunk of skin off my leg. That <laughs> took over a month to heal, and now I have a beautiful scar. And everyone's like, oh, is that a bruise? I'm like, nope. <laughs> Battle scars. So I think the most important question that I'm going to have for you is, can I take my one wheel through the track tomorrow? No. Dang. Okay. Oh. Wait, <laughs> wait. Which one's your one wheel? Is yours the one you sit inside it? No, mine's oh. the one you ride on a skateboard. Oh, I mean, technically, yes, you can. Just not during the races. <laughs> no, you're good. You're good. Well, thank you so much for coming on and hanging out with us for a little bit. It's no been problem. awesome to talk to you. I um, realize I should have introduced myself as Karen Cannonball Corbiel. I mean, of I course. I'm of, I, think I'm, I think I'm one of the only drivers that ever actually like earned a nickname for like a Power Wheels driver. <laughs> <laughs> well, where can people <laughs> find you on the internet? Oh, shoot. Uh, let's see. Ooh, man. Uh, I am on Facebook, but you have to know me personally. Actually, if you want to find me on the internet, so what I do for a living, uh, I actually work for Element 14, and I make an educational electronics oh, nice. YouTube show. Oh. So if you search for Element 14 Presents and look for the show The Learning Circuit, it comes out every third Wednesday. And uh, if you don't know anything about electronics, neither did I. <laughs> um, Fair enough. I taught myself, and then I wrote episodes about what I learned and so that you can learn, too. Well. Um, and I've, I've gotten a lot of positive feedback. So... That's if awesome. You, if you want to learn electronics from not an engineer, <laughs> watch my show. Well, we will send our people your way. Thank you again so Thanks. much. This is fun. All right. So this is Joe from Makers on Tap. And who are you? Joel Leonard. Why are you? Why? Why? Why are you here? What are you doing? Well, I'm, uh, you know, you guys know me. You've interviewed me before. But I'm, I'm the guy that uh, they call the Makers Maker because I've been going all around the country and trying to preserve and maintain and grow the Maker Movement. And trying to keep the maker spaces from uh, having different factions and different fights and uh, and going out of business. And uh, so, uh, I'd like to talk tonight about a couple of new initiatives that are underway to try to uh, build more peace and get more maker spaces focusing on making and not on fighting. I've oh. been a, in the middle of a few uh, doing some peacekeeping at a few board meetings at some maker spaces around and. I've had to set the tone because there were some doing these peeing contests and they were trying to trying to trying to make themselves look big by pushing other people down, and uh, that's just not cool. No, and that's not the purpose of why we're doing things. If people have an ego issue, they need to go somewhere else. They, yeah, if they want to make something, they need to stay. Yeah, and so I've been really pushing hard to get more community builds built and getting more maker spaces to think about. The crazy stuff, like you've been talking tonight. I mean, it's so energizing to see a makerspace come up with a crazy thing that you never would think would be possible. That gets the imagination. That gets the inspiration. That, and it also it pulls people together, mm -hmm. uh, not replicating what's already out there. And in fact, I ran into a guy that was bragging about he could make his own toothpicks out of a 3D printer. Okay. Okay, so my problem with a lot of maker spaces is they become little tinker shops and people make cool stuff. Now it's cool stuff, but it's for a desk. Something that they can, you know, they might put scan in their face and put it on a bottle. Mm -hmm. What is that going to do? That ain't going to make any money. That ain't going to help you build a grant. But if you uh, three, if you go out and do an ADA compliant ramp and teach a whole bunch of people how to do that, and you go and donate those to communities and, and uh, stores and things like that, and help the people that are that are um, handicapped, help them get in and out. You break that down when you go for a next another grant, they'll you'll have credentials. Yeah. Uh, so that's the kind of stuff we got to start boosting and elevating the thought process. And that's why when Magic Wheelchair asked me to help them get more uh, builds done, because they've got a list. Of, I don't know how many. It's, it's almost up to a couple of hundred kid, kiddos, as they call them, keep people that are confined to a wheelchair. 
uh, they build a Halloween costume for them that's elaborate. I mean, Google Magic Wheelchair and look up all the past uh, things. These things are fascinating little engineering projects that maker spaces have been building. The problem is they just nobody builds enough of them. Yeah. And these kids, some of these kiddos are on the list for two and three years. And they're sitting there waiting to get a thing, and they're in the meantime they're feeling alienated and and feeling freakish. Was whereas if they had a magic wheelchair and they go out to the Halloween and other events, they feel like a superstar or a superhero. So, so we've got to step up. It's not only to help the community, but also to help the spaces build their sense of pride and sense of uh, of community by building these things. I mean, you, when you build one, you can easily the, – the people that do it, even they've done them three or four years ago, they're proud about it. Yeah. Because it is, it is really a thing to behold, and it's really cool to see somebody who you know just by luck or whatever the circumstance, they are not having a life that we ha- take for granted. Right. And they have an unbelievable experience. They're transcended by these little bitty costumes. So if somebody wanted to do a magic wheelchair, how would they get started? Well, I'd like them to reach out to me, joelskilltv at gmail.com, and then I can connect them. I'd like to talk to them a little bit, explain to them really what's involved, and then connect them to the people at Magic Wheelchair, and then they get matched up. Okay. And something that they need to, to know as they go into this Magic Wheelchair allows the kids to come up with the ideas of what they want to have built. It's not for somebody's ego to go say, hey, I built uh, uh, whatever that they think of, a UFO and the shape that they want. When the kid wants to get a SpongeBob SquarePants thing, yeah, yeah. they need to get a SpongeBob SquarePants thing. So, so there's been some instances where that has happened, and the uh, maker, uh, the they, Magic Wheelchair wants to to emphasize that the kids make that call okay and so but if they're willing to do that and subordinate themselves and 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 uh help boost a kid it's a hell of a damn project and again you write that on a grant because as you know when you're a nonprofit, good works equals good money yeah so either you uh if you do things for the community you write that down and you show proof and you put that in your portfolio when you go for a grant there's high likelihood that they're going to give it to you because you've done this so many good things. Yeah. So, so those were the points I wanted to emphasize. So we're at Milwaukee Maker Fair weekend. We're at the Milwaukee Maker Space now. What's your favorite thing that you've seen this weekend? Well, it, it's I. What I love about this group is the camaraderie. Okay, having the cool inventions is great, but you there is a genuine affection in this space, and it there's. There's minimal dysfunction. Yeah. Uh, there's minimal tension. I mean, they're either putting on one hell of a show or I haven't seen it. And I've been, this is my second time up here, and I've interacted with a lot of people. They love coming here. You feel joy coming here. Yeah. Well, um, if people want to find you on the internet, where do they need to find you? Well, the easiest thing is Joel Leonard on Facebook uh, or LinkedIn. Okay. Well, thanks, Thank Joel. Thank you, guys. It's been good Thanks having you on. Thanks for what you do, man.